Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today on cloud security with MITRE ATT&CK. We're just going to give a couple minutes, courtesy minutes, for people to file in. Looks like you guys are all filing in pretty rapidly here. Grab a cup of coffee or a Red Bull, whatever suits your fancy, and uh, we'll be back on in just a couple minutes. All right, everybody, let's get this show on the road. We're so glad you're all able to join us today for this webinar on cloud security with MITRE ATT&CK. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jonathan Ryber, our VP of Cybersecurity Strategy and Policy at ATT&CK IQ to introduce himself and all of our special guests uh, that'll be leading our presentation today. So over to you, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you here with us. Um, and I'm very pleased to have this great panel of experts. I mean, when you enter a job like this, you think, how how many smart people am I going to get to interact with, and like, how great is it going to be? And it's such a it's such an honor to have the, our three guests here. They've contributed. So we all came together because of a Center for Threat Informed Defense Research Project that John Baker is about to tell you about. But they all contributed, in some cases, quite directly to a book that we've published. And we thought, let's do a webinar, bring everyone together, and, and have a good spirited conversation. So we've got John Baker, the director of the Center for Threat Informed Defense. Hey, John. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for having us. Great. John's in, in Ireland, I think. Is that right, John? Yeah, I'm at the first conference, which has been an amazing event so far. We've got a few more days to go. Great. Um, and Malin Carmichael of uh, Microsoft's Security Threat Intelligence Center, the Mystic, not the M Stick. Is that right? <laughs> so, Did I get it right? Yeah. Mystic. <laughs> okay, yep. Great. Hello. Thanks for having me. And you're in, um, wait, you just told me this yesterday. Where are you in England? I'm in Cheltenham, which is in the sort of southwest of, of England. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for joining. And Iman Ganizada. Hey, Iman. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. I actually just left London, so <laughs> yeah, I escaped. <laughs> yeah. Iman joins us from um, Google Cloud. Are you, are you in Sunnyvale today? Yeah, yeah, I'm up in Sunnyvale right now. The weather is pretty sunny, uh, as expected. It's nice. Um, we've got a we've got a, a little event going on here, uh, getting the whole team together. But last week I was at Infosec in uh, in London and. Um, and there was apparently there was some protests on the tube, and so the first yeah. day of Infosec, you know, uh, so excited to to go see a bunch of clients, customers, so on and so forth. <laughs> and I kid you not, it was literally just vendors. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was no customers there. So what I do, I went and I found one of the vendors that had a racing simulator set up, and uh, <laughs> I just tried to beat everyone's lap time. I actually got second place, oh. uh, maybe second of two. So. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. You should have driven up to Cheltenham. We could have done this uh, with you in London. And the yeah. driven up in the simulator. That would have been nice. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. Well, this is like this is going to be a lot of fun. Obviously, Iman has promised to heckle me, um, <laughs> and uh, he joined the webinar at exactly eight fifty nine point five nine seconds. So that's that was his first heckle. Um, <laughs> great. Okay. So. I thought we'd start by pivoting to John because the research that the Center for Threat Informed Defense launched is really what brought us here. So I'm gonna go to share screen because it, it looks like the slide is a little bit hard to read. Is that true, everyone? Maybe not, I don't know. Let's see if I can expand the view here. 
Um, and uh, and John, over to you. Hmm. I don't think that quite came through, but uh, yeah, Jonathan, thanks thanks for having us um, here. Really excited to get to talk with you and the, the community here about the recent research project we released. Um, so fundamentally, we brought a whole group of sophisticated security teams together and uh, developed a set of mappings between the native cloud security capabilities of the Google Cloud Platform and to attack. And ultimately that gives defenders um, sort of this independent technical insight into how those native security capabilities in the Google Cloud Platform can help them defend against the threats that they care about, right? Mm -hmm. So over the last couple of years, we've, um, with community support and through the center's research program, been kind of slowly, steadily building out um, the MITRE ATT&CK knowledge base, which for those of you that are new to attack, is a knowledge base of known adversary TTPs. Um, so think of it as the technical uh, behaviors or approaches that adversaries use to achieve their goals. So it's broken down into tactics and techniques um, and kind of allows you to start to think about how adversaries achieve their goals across the life cycle of an attack. When we got started with the Center for Threat and Form Defense, a few years back, one of our first projects was to uh, take what we had started with Attack for Cloud and um, expand upon that and start to work with the community a little bit more aggressively with a little bit more purpose to um, refine the set of uh, data sources in Attack for Cloud. So what, what are the data sources that will allow you to detect these behaviors, overhaul the way we describe platforms, um, and, and basically make the, the corpus of techniques in attack much more accessible and consistent with the rest of the attack knowledge base. Um, so there, there's a lot of work that will continue to go on and um, is needed to continue just driving the sustainment and growth of the attack knowledge base. Um, one of the key uh, sort of premises of the attack knowledge base is it's entirely intelligence driven. So uh, what that means is entries in the attack knowledge base aren't theoretical. It means um, it's actually happened. Adversaries have actually used those specific techniques in known attacks. Um, and so with attack for cloud, there is this sort of fundamental challenge we have. Um, there's a bit of underreporting, we think, across the community in um, attacks against cloud environments. Um, like, you know, where the reporting would go down into that level of detail of specifically what adversaries have done to achieve their goals. Um, that reporting is essential to help us continue to build out the attack knowledge base. Um, the good news is, you know, through the center and with community contributions, we have some great relationships with folks working to change that increased reporting and help us expand out um, that baseline knowledge of what it is adversaries do uh, to achieve their goals in cloud environments. Right, and that, that's really where this center project could come in, um, taking that base knowledge that we have captured in the uh, attack knowledge base and kind of going the next step. Um, I love to share this story from one of our center participants. And um, that participant, I guess, John, you can go to the next slide here. Okay. So I give think, you a little I think bit. we'll screen it. <laughs> I'm trying here. All right. Give me you can tell I'm like a writer. Well, I'll keep going. Um, well, well, Jonathan gets that slide going. Uh, Is it this one, John? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, so the the center. Sorry about that. The the center fundamentally brings together sophisticated security teams from across the community to identify hard problems like how do we improve our understanding of what adversaries are doing in cloud environments and use that to systematically advance our defenses. So that's a hard problem that we're working on in the Center for Threat and Form Defense. So we have about 30 member organizations that come together, identify these hard problems, and then work to solve them. And when we're done, we publish the results of that work. And so Jonathan, if you can go to the next slide. Um, our most yep. recent publication is that set of mappings between uh, MITRE ATT&CK and uh, the Google Cloud Platform's native security capabilities. Um, so this work, the kind of the genesis for it, 
was one of our center participants basically saying, hey, um, it's great that we did that project around attack for cloud. Um, I love that we've expanded out the knowledge base and refined it and improved it. But what I really need is to be able to answer the so what for cloud. And when you kind of picked away at that, what he was asking for was, how do we take that and operationalize it from the perspective of a defender who's trying to defend resources in cloud environments? And that's what led to this project, where um, in talking through things with him, it was, you know, it was hard to understand what native security capabilities that platform had and how they could defend against the attack techniques that his team was focused on. Um, they weren't sure if they could use native capabilities, if they needed to develop their own detection capabilities, if they needed to buy third-party services or capabilities to solve that problem. Um, and so ultimately within the center, we realized, well, wait a second, that, that first step there how do those security capabilities help you defend against attacks in the attack knowledge base? That's something that the community generally needs to know. It's the foundational step to understanding and in, 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 uh, operationalizing threat informed defense. We have our understanding of adversary behaviors. Now, how do I defend against those? That's threat informed defense. So uh, with support from uh, the Google team and, and our other center participants, we've now uh, mapped out the security capabilities of Azure, AWS, and the Google Cloud Platform and publish those mappings for the community to leverage and build upon. By the way, this, um, this is like yeah. one of the very critical things that our customers have been asking for for years, which is, um, you know, most people nowadays are starting to really value this MITRE framework as a standard for how they approach building out their defensive capabilities across their environments um, and also trying to sort of build this uh, relatability between different environments, which is what makes MITRE so powerful because in a world where everything is heterogeneous, um, MITRE brings uh, a bit of a homogenous view to how we can start to analyze and build defensive capabilities across these different environments. So, you know, for, for years, our customers have been asking us, uh, you know, do you have, the mappings uh, you know for mitre for the various cloud capabilities in gcp and we have had an internal uh you know uh, collection of this that we have built out you know the google internal team has their own mitre mappings for for their work for us on the customer facing side we you know we have a set of things that we would provide but really providing this and publishing this publicly to the world is probably one of the really great things that we just need to make sure everyone sees now because it exists people have been asking for it and now we have to figure out how people can also operationalize this data um you know across their own environments yeah i think that's that's spot on i'm on and my goal with this project and, and generally through the center's research program is develop to develop really impactful resources and make sure that the community knows about them and that they're easily used to, to make a difference right um, I think we have a really good foundation now. We have that foundational knowledge of how these security capabilities can defend against the threats you care about, right? Um, I think there's opportunity to help the community kind of dig into, okay, well, how do I detect those threats in these environments? So some focus on the detection side of things, I think is another place that's sort of ripe for further R&D. And then I think um, there's a, an opportunity to build out some baseline capabilities that help people kind of uh, process and analyze the mappings that we've done and apply them within the context of their own organization. So there's uh, some opportunity to kind of continue to expand on these foundational resources, but we've created this baseline knowledge now, leveraging that common vocabulary. John, could I ask you, you know, one of the things that's impressed me the most about Attack, and that I found that when I talk to customers, when I talk to the press, uh, is that CISA now uses the attack framework whenever there's an emergent threat, right? And the example that I like to use the most is solar winds. When solar winds happens, the US government can talk about what the intruder did without attributing it. And this is in December of 2020, I guess. Uh, the, the intrusion had happened, CISA made the alert, they're talking about it. And then there's a political decision later about whether you attribute it. And that to me is like this, the best example of how and why attack is enabling defenders all over the world to think about the adversary. And I wonder, you know, you're, you just released this great impact report about the center's research. You've got 
this research has come out and we're having this conversation like what are your what are some of your impressions about how much attack has been adopted by the defensive community and like how do you see this evolving because i'm always explaining it to the press and people like they they're like they're not going to lie to me and say they're not going to admit to me that they don't know what it is but really they don't and then i have to open it and walk them through it and stuff like that yeah it, it's a good question and it's uh it's timely so as you mentioned earlier i'm at the first conference and uh across the set of talks happening at the first conference um i've seen i was trying to count it up probably like 10 or so talks that talk about how teams are using MITRE ATT&CK or reference using MITRE ATT&CK. I mentioned that because I think at, at this point, it is really used globally by security teams you know, all around the world. Um, it's used by security teams as like that common vocabulary is sort of the, the first thing that happens. People start correlating detection capabilities. People start thinking about how defensive capabilities help them defend against specific threats. People start looking at um, and comparing adversaries and tracking adversary behaviors using that common vocabulary, right? Or work towards um, emulating um, and you know testing security capabilities based on that common vocabulary. So now we have that ability to kind of correlate all those activities around that standard term, right? A technique identification and a name. Um, for that technique. And so that's been um, really critical. And I would also say that um, you see a lot of this happening within the more sophisticated security teams. I think one of the things that, you know, kind of forward looking that we need to do is develop resources, guidance, um, tools to help the other teams that are a little bit less resourced and um, don't have quite the, the level of, uh, you know, budget, if you will, to, to support. Um, Kind of exploring and, and developing their own in-house capabilities we need to help the rest of the world uh, catch on and, and really operationalize attack and take that uh, sort of threat informed defense perspective um, yeah. and so it's something that i certainly want us to tackle through the center's research program and i think it's it's one of those things that we all kind of owe it to each other to step back and think about how do we make this much easier for all of the security teams to implement and run with that's awesome. So that's I think that's a good spot to pivot. And I'll say to, to all the folks listening, what, we're, what we'd like to do for the rest of the session after John's great introduction of the research is we'll pivot next to Iman, who works obviously for a cloud provider, um, and hear some of his thoughts about how cloud has changed the world and some of his initial thoughts on security. And then Madeline, who's doing great threat intelligence research for Microsoft, will ask you some questions about some of the research you've been doing. And to John's last point about making attack more useful for the world and accessible, I think we'll end then on um, some of the best practices in threat informed defense that that a lot of us have been working on. So with that, uh, Iman, I'll pivot over to you. Well, before we <laughs> before you ask me anything, I just wanted to highlight that this is the sheer fact that in this webinar right now we've got Madeline here, and we've got you from Attack IQ, we've got Google here. It just shows the power of MITRE as a community-based uh, initiative, uh, because uh, you know this is this is basically the essence of of the work that we do, which is um, we're all building and trying to solve the same problems in the same space, and we get to use some of the brightest people in the world, like Madeline from the Mystic team, um, and Jonathan, right? A lot of the work that your Attack IQ has done to really uh, bring the center to a lot of companies actually you guys have done a lot of work in this space um this is this is beautiful like i love that uh, and i think this is a good opportunity to just highlight that the center research to me like this was our first project getting involved here and i want to like loop in as many google people as possible to make sure we've got enough support and coverage over all the different areas but it was just amazing to see how you know we've got folks that we partner with folks that we compete with uh, all here working together on one common mission, which is improving, you know, uh, the knowledge of how to solve these challenges so that we can actually democratize the complexity of security to people um, that, you know, uh, that aren't as talented uh, as, as you and Madeline are. Um, so I thought that was something that was really cool to highlight. Or are much more talented, but just need the information. And... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. We do reinvent a lot of wheels, and, and uh, to your point there. <laughs> it also it also helps that people really like John. So when John publishes something, 
everyone watches and listens. And that's actually how I connected with John, like way before this whole thing kicked off as John published the, the Azure mappings actually. And I was like, ah, oh, I was like, this is really cool. This is amazing work. Like, uh, next thing you know, a couple months later, this MITRE initiative came up and, I, and John and I met. And I was like, ah, you're the guy that I, uh, that I saw on, uh, on Medium. <laughs> Totally. If he was a big meanie, he wouldn't get as much support, but he's such a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, you know, my thoughts around everything in the space, I, I talk a lot about history in the context of like computing and also in the context of the world and where we are and where we're going. Because like a lot of times security practitioners get siloed into a role where they're told how to think and it's linear thinking but at the more successful companies uh people are a little bit more creative in their jobs and this is the idea of like engineering right um but engineering doesn't necessarily have to be technical skill like it, it's it's just being more creative about how you solve problems right but uh but i bring this up because um, if you look at where we are today in the history of like security, I mean, even cloud security, the cloud is very, very, very new. Okay. Very new. Like, and computing is also very new. Like we write in our history books, we write, you know, it's the year 2022, right? But like the human race, like is dated, dates back 2.9 million years, right? Um, but now imagine if we wrote 2.9, whatever, whatever, whatever in our history books, like it would change the way we looked at the world, right? And in computing, like, you know what, uh, the internet really took off in the 90s, but it was 1969 in which the first, the the what DARPAnet project happened. So if we wrote, you know, it's really the year 50 or 60 from the advent of our digital lives, maybe this would de-stress a lot of things and people would realize that actually, we don't know what the hell we're doing because yeah, we've only I, actually had can I chime years. in with a different a different historical frame really quickly? We went from zero to four point eight billion in the lifespan of um, Chris Hemsworth and Nicki Minaj, who were born the same year as TCP IP. So that's the example I like to use, right? It's like they're thirty-nine or thirty-eight or something. Nineteen eighty two is the year TCP IP started. So yeah. imagine it went from zero to four point eight billion in Nicki Minaj's lifespan. Uh, then you begin to sort of be like, there's, we're lucky that worse things haven't happened. Sorry to interrupt. That's just no, 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 that's, that's perfect. And that's, that's exactly the point, which is like, we need to find creative ways to be able to build scalable solutions to problems, scalable solutions to problems, because the linear thinking works when you have 2.9 million years of evolution. But when you have had 30, 40 years of this rapid growth and scale of, of data volumes that we literally cannot scale to this is where uh things like miter attack for example on the right side i always say the left side is like devops and you know the build side of the world and the right side is threat management um, but this is where frameworks like miter on the right side of the world are super valuable for our customers and we just have to continue to figure out how we can take highly complex knowledge and standardize it in a way and also make it usable because you can have like the best phone in the world, the, you know, the Sony, whatever, with a 10 gigapixel camera, but like the iPhone is really usable, right? And if we can make MITRE more operate, if we can operationalize the insights that MITRE provides to our customers, we can use that on two fronts. Uh, customers can use that with respect to how they build their uh, preventative architectures, their controls, and also how they monitor their environments for adversarial behavior, but also the people building the cloud, right? The product managers, the engineering teams, they also have a good idea of where there are gaps in some of the capabilities that they may provide out of box or as an add-on to their products. And this can be very valuable to build more baked in security by default. Um, and that's that's what's the real value here. But Madeline, I'm actually curious because, um, you know, I'm really here just to hear uh, your thoughts. Uh, Jonathan, we've already talked too many times. I want to get your thoughts on this topic. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think kind of as I said in the in the ebook, um, from my background being a librarian and that that kind of perspective, obviously anything that can kind of classify and label data, um, I, I support. <laughs> Um, and generally, the way my team uses it is as like a layer on top of the data and the threat until that we curate and, and the actors that we find. Uh, and just 
like John has said previously, it's a common vocabulary. So even like it's useful to discuss things throughout the community, but it's equally useful just discussing threats between teams here at Microsoft. Um, because you have threat hunters and you have defenders and people writing detections and analytics and you need that common thread throughout that entire conversation end to end to make sure that you're communicating clearly, concisely and consistently. And we find MITRE ATT&CK is really useful for that. Um, yeah, like every time that I come back and tell somebody about one of the projects or um, anything to do with ATT&CK, I find the ideas just kind of come out of the woodwork and they go, oh, well, I was thinking about using it this way or can you help me uh, speak with the attack team like is this something that would be of interest to them and it just kind of snowballs every time you talk to somebody about it yeah i sum it up as like uh that common vocabulary so for a threat intel perspective it's like what am i seeing um right and so we drop in the attack technique name uh from a detection engineer or, or like the the SOC analyst perspective what can we defend against there's your your specific adversary behavior from like the uh, test and evaluation side or emulation and kind of side of things. What are we testing? And it's all leveraging that common term. So we know we're all talking about the same thing. We're looking at this threat from an Intel perspective. We've developed defenses um, for this particular threat and we're testing our defenses based on that particular threat. So. Yeah, and I think the, the visual element of it that it's laid out in a hierarchical matrix really helps make it make sense for people. Um, a lot of people are visual learners, even if they wouldn't necessarily self-identify that way. And tools like the Attack Navigator, where you can layer multiple layers on top of each other to kind of pick out where there's gaps in, um, well, either a gap in a defense where you're saying, here is a mapping on what this product security capabilities are, and here is what this threat actor that I care about typically does. If there's a mismatch then that helps prioritize where you need to build new detections and defenses but equally if you're someone coming at it from a well what threat actors do i need to care about from my circumstances point of view you can put two or three or four or five threat actors on top of each other and kind of really pick out which techniques are universal across all of those and again it helps you prioritize where you need to focus so that that's actually something that like i want to double tap on because that's that's a really good point, which you said, if you look at this from my perspective, which is the intelligence driven perspective, things start to change a little bit, right? And all right, I just came up with this crazy idea like uh, a couple seconds ago, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys this this idea I have, which is like let's are you all familiar with Lord of the Rings, Battle of the Two Towers? Right? Okay. So the Battle of Helm's Deep, okay. Imagine you are the architect designing Helm's Deep to be secure, right? Like, ah, we, okay, we built this, you know, big massive door that, you know, has enough protection to survive X amount of Oryx. We have this moat. We've got, you know, a couple archers that we can build all around this castle. Like you're starting to uh, basically design what a, a secure, you know, uh, castle can look like, right? But the intelligence driven perspective is more of like, well, I have an idea of who my adversaries are, and I know there's going to be someone that's super powerful that's going to bring this giant bomb through, you know, that can that has that has capable of bringing this this weapon to detonate and destroy this entire aspect of my castle. And so let's actually think about our adversaries when we design architectures. That way, we're uh, we're we're proactively thinking about the threats that can impact us most, and that's like this place where there's this gap in between we have people that are still struggling to find like a uh, built-in best uh, security by default but the elite organizations in the world are actually taking an intelligence driven approach first and how they design their architectures and their security operations teams do such a great job of not only operationalizing threat intelligence across their SOC but also where their SOC can then also influence the design and development of architecture for organizations downstream. So now the castle doesn't just look like the Battle of Helm's Deep that you know we thought it would be. Now we've thought about what our adversaries' behaviors can look like in the future, and we've designed it in a way to prevent exactly what we'd be seeing in the field. Just one of the things I love about Helm's Deep that I used to say um, when I worked at Illumio is it's really a defense in depth strategy too, because 
it's your fallback, it's resilient. Uh, the perimeter gets breached, obviously. The orcs are coming through the windows. Oh God, what are we gonna do? But lo and behold, we've got this fallback, you know, an, an, an internal firewall, which is really what it is. And they can go back and so anyway, building on the metaphor, which is endlessly useful. <laughs> Mandiant uh, Gandalf is like Mandiant <laughs> coming in to save the day. <laughs> yeah, of course I would probably dispute that, and I'd say Gandalf is more like Attack IQ, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. So, um, Malin, actually, like you've prepared some a slide. Let me see if I can share this. I think <laughs> I had a bit of a technical issue a second ago. Um, Hey, maybe Jordan, could you flip the presenter back to me, perhaps? Jordan McMahon is our great director of corporate marketing, um, and she's always helping me out of every single situation in which I put myself. Which... You are now the presenter. I was enjoying the Lord of the Rings discussion, but uh, <laughs> you can take it over again. <laughs> exactly. So um, can you all see this? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll probably just uh, put it in slideshow mode. Okay, all right. I tried that earlier and it didn't work. You, yeah. you all can see I'm, I'm more averse to the writing than the PowerPoints. <laughs> Is that better? No. No. Oh, well. Yeah. I haven't, used, I haven't used Office in so long. But what about that slideshow tab uh, right at the top? No. I, okay. All right. Let's see here. <laughs> Madeline, with apologies to your beautiful slides. I know. I spent so much time on it. Look at all those attack techniques at the bottom. <laughs> Oh, we'll, you did, send all the slides. we'll send all the slides to the attendees sure. today too so that they can see everything um really yes. well after. there we go solution we go. that's a that's <laughs> a highly effective solution okay so imagine that you can see this go ahead madeline yeah i mean um so a couple of the questions that we discussed before the presentation um were sort of like what are some of the things that are different about threat hunting in a cloud environment? Um, what are some of the threat actors that we've seen having impacts in, in cloud environments? Um, and so really, I just put this slide together as kind of um, just something to have on the screen while I was speaking, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, but what they are, um, and could you actually like lift it a little bit? I don't, it, I've like lost the bottom of the screen. Oh, I see. Is that better? Can you see it now? No. You're no. like, your whole yeah, window. Right. Well, okay. window right. Right. Interesting. Uh huh. Y'all, this is like yeah. obviously I need to go through <laughs> when there's not a thousand people watching. So, <laughs> is that better? Um, but yeah, so these are three blogs that uh, Mystic has contributed to or written in the last few months where there's some level of relevance to cloud environments. And um, so the one on the left uh, about Polonium. Um, they are an actor that we have seen abusing OneDrive. Um, they have been using it as part of their command and control infrastructure. Um, and in fact, in this case, it's not actually a vulnerability or a security issue. It's just legitimate usage of, of the product. And we see this happening a lot in cloud spaces where the scale at which you can work in the cloud is faster bigger, um, more automated, which is great for legitimate use cases, but equally great for malicious ones. Um, and yeah, just kind of at the bottom or a few of the cloud relevant techniques that are discussed in that blog. Um, so we've got like acquiring infrastructure, web services, um, stealing application access tokens, trusted relationships, and similar for the Nobelium one. I mean, you wrote a reference SolarWinds already, which is these guys. Um, we're seeing the supply chain compromise as one of the techniques there, trusted relationships again. Um, and so I think like preparing for this, one of the things that kind of stood out to me was, was that trusted relationships factor showing up in a lot of these as everything as a service is becoming the model for a lot of how people work. You're creating those new relationships where they might not have been in an on-premise environment. And those, those relationships can be quite vulnerable. Um, as we see in these two cases. And then the ransomware as a service blog over on the right, it's actually going through many different uh, ransomware groups that we, we follow here. And just kind of, again, the scale of cloud infrastructure and, and the speed at which you can work within it is really attractive to ransomware groups. They work at a much bigger scale. They like to set up and take down infrastructure quickly. Um, and it makes it hard, that does make it harder to track sometimes because they're switching all over the place. 
But I guess on the flip side, um, that speed and automation can benefit defenders as well. Uh, you can, when you've found fraudulent or malicious use of a service, it's easier to take that down when it's a, an actor account kind of thing. Um, but yeah, one of the other factors, I guess, that first question of what what is different about hunting in a cloud environment mm -hmm. certainly is needing really good logs, um, having having logs for the right stuff, not over logging so that you don't know how to find what you need within it. Um, obviously, storage is expensive as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, need, you, you also need to know how, how to aggregate logs across different um, providers. I mean, multi-cloud is definitely the way of the world these days. Um, and then I guess the importance of identity and, and user accounts has really come to the forefront as well. Um, if an adversary gets access to a privileged account in a cloud environment, you really need to have a handle on how, how much access that account has, um, how, how much impact can happen based on that one account. Is it privileged? Does it have access to admin for certain subscription stuff? Um, yeah, just, and again, that, that one kind of plays into once you have access to a compromised account, you can leverage a lot of the legitimate functionality that exists in the cloud environment, um, which can make it harder to find anomalous activity because that might be an expected behavior for that account. Yep. Um, could I could I ask um, Madison, uh, or one of our researchers on the line, could you put the links, if you haven't yet already, to these different blogs into the chat? I put them in, Jonathan. We're you all did. good. Thank yes, you. Sir. Yep, excellent. Um, so Madeline, so what are what are some of the things that you've heard in your so you're a, you're a threat intelligence researcher and you've got this great background in library science which makes so much sense I think when you look at the panoply of threats and all the information coming at us um, and also it makes sense like the, the correlation between miter attack and library science is fascinating but what are some of the things that you've heard from defensive teams when they think about attack for cloud and like, what what are some of the things that that you've heard, if anything, that's that's made it so much easier for them um, in their operations? Uh, I mean, first off, I guess I would say the introduction of the cloud matrix and the sort of subsets within that has been really well received. I know it previously was challenging to like look across how the entire the entirety of the attack matrix and kind of pinpoint what was actually relevant in a cloud um, cloud environment. So that has been super, super helpful. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just like we said before, there are that common way of describing stuff across teams to customers between detections and what they're seeing in their portals. Um, ha having having that as as a common sort of language is, is really good. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we should all read these blogs, um, and, and I, I love how you've identified the different techniques in the blog. Microsoft has done such a great job, uh, particularly in the Ukraine war, uh, really releasing great threat intelligence about what's going on, really been at the forefront of, of a lot of informing the world's thinking from a cyberspace operations standpoint. So your work is vital. Um, any other questions for Malin at this point? It's very, Great. it's very, very vital work. Like, and this is like the, uh, this is the the point. Like, if you, you know, and John, you and I chatted about, you know, the infrastructure is code conversation, and and everything is code. Uh, you know how how you know the cloud, in a way, makes it uh, easier um, to be able to deploy uh, large. Uh, deployments of infrastructure or changes to infrastructure with everything, you know, being written as code. Uh, but at the same time, it's also like managing a global supply chain, you know, like this, like this hint bottle, I'm sure when they first started making the water, it was like easy to manage, you know, when they had a couple physical sites to create the water and the labels and the packaging and all that. But then, you know, expanding to a global footprint, right, it's just infinitely more complex. And that's what the cloud really did is it, it made you know, things that were under your control, you know, you had these data centers that you owned, you had everything under your control. In a way, it seemed like it was easier, but it was more prone to nuances and failures. But then with this massive supply chain of the cloud, you know, uh, we can deploy and instantiate things, um, you know, 
at, at any at, at cloud scale and speed, uh, but it takes a, a lot more rigor. There's a lot more rigor on improving the process and securing <laughs> the process so that you don't have a large scale fault or flaw. And so like what MITRE does here and then what the work Madeline is doing, it basically like if defenders by default have a way to provide like go back to Lord of the Rings example. If by default defenders have a very easy way to deploy the basic defenses that provide them enough coverage, the layers of defense in depth across their, you know, their organizations, right? Like that's great. But then the work Madeline is doing on the Intel side is basically now taking all of that intelligence, human intelligence, OS intelligence, all that sort of stuff, and trying to bring that knowledge to those same defenders so that they have an eye out in the field of what's actually happening in the world today. And then they can also improve and build better detection and response capabilities based off of Intel. And that's super critical because everyone says they're using Intel, but the reality of organizations that are actually making sense of it like is very slim. And the amount of complexity that like the knowledge of threat Intel researchers have versus being able to bridge that knowledge from their work to detection and response and SIM and SOAR and everything in between, it's like a mountain of work that most organizations do very poorly, especially in the cloud. Yeah, Amon, I, I just say, you know, that reality that, you know, so many organizations just don't actually have the ability to take in and, and do something actionable with Threat Intel. It's it's important to, to keep in mind. Um, I feel like Often, you know, I, I work with with you guys and some other like really sophisticated security teams, and they have big programs and teams whose like whole job is to translate like that intel into something that a hunt team can use or a red team can use or the SOC team can use, and that's not the reality for uh, most teams. And uh, there's a huge challenge out there to take that intel, which is critical, and make it actually easy to use um, and, and easy to um, sort of defend against uh, the, the attacks that are described in the reporting. So. I have to say, this isn't just me. There are a lot of other people behind this <laughs> doing a lot of really good work. That's why you call it the mystic, which is great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that's probably a good time to, to pivot to the implementation of threat intelligence and how we make this as useful as we possibly can for, for defenders. Um, and so, uh, like, we obviously, like, we have a strong argument at Attack IQ, which is we want to take, we want to automate security control validation by building adversary emulations using the MITRE attack frameworks that defenders can use at any given moment. They can emulate the adversary against their security program. And why would you do that, right? Like um, the MITRE attack matrix takes this intelligence that I, when it first came out in 2015, I was in the Pentagon and every, up until then, I like to use an example. There was a, a major Russian intrusion and I can't talk about the victim in 2010. It was top secret. I was on a, a computer because my boss had injured his back and I couldn't talk to anyone about what had happened. I couldn't talk about the victim. I couldn't describe the attacker. And it was impossible. So it was like everything was so deeply compartmented that for years you couldn't talk about what we knew was happening, right? Now, when attack comes along, all of a sudden you can describe the behaviors. And this is why I made the point early on about attribution that's agnostic. Now, if you built the best Navy in the world, or let's say you have a World Cup qualifying team, right, for the sake of... Um, for the sake of Madeline, who is the actual European uh, on the phone call, um, the English team, right? One of the best. Passport. What's that? Got a you passport. <laughs> <laughs> Every, we're going to build you one. <laughs> we're going to send you one. Um, Canadian. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Yes. My apologies. Yeah. I, I just I renationalized you. Um, <laughs> so based in England, right? So imagine the 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 Canadian soccer team. Let's go. So we'll, we'll honor your your heritage, right? <laughs> Imagine that they're in the World Cup and they're they're playing against the Italians, but they or the the Argentine team, but they take six weeks off, and they drink a bunch of beer, and they don't watch any tapes about Macy, and then they go out on the pitch on the day of the game, and they're like they haven't watched his, any any Macy videos, right? Are, would you expect them to defeat the Argentine team? No, you wouldn't. They'd sprain their hamstrings, they he would run circles around them, and uh, they would get handily defeated. 
let's just suspend disbelief for a moment that it's the Canadian soccer team, right? Imagine that they're actually really good. <laughs> in the World Cup. That is. <laughs> Yeah, big suspension of disbelief. That's essentially the state of cybersecurity operations today, right? Um, we have found in our research, which we'll be announcing here soon, like security control failures are constant, and the the the, the amount of detection successes, detect prevention and detection and prevention successes is far lower than you would think, and that's because teams don't exercise. So you have the best capabilities in the world, produced by Google Cloud, Microsoft. Amazon, or also vendors like CrowdStrike, Cyber Reason, the best capabilities in the world. They work in our labs. We know that they're working for our, for our labs, but when they go into our customer environments, for whatever reason, like life, like soccer teams, they change. Um, the analogy of weak muscles is misconfiguration, or there's new infrastructure that gets added in, or in the cloud environment, if you're, build, if you're transitioning to a cloud, you may have a legacy server that you've left open somewhere that's not secure, that's now tacked onto your new cloud, and that gives the adversary an ingress method. And because teams aren't training, you're vulnerable. Now, it's code is vulnerable in general. So, so the, the, the point here is like to say teams aren't training, and MITRE ATT&CK gives us a capability not just to do atomic one-off testing, but to string things together into a chain. So um, let me pivot to my screen just really quickly I, with apologies about my uh, PowerPoint skills, which are obviously deficient. So what, what we hear from CISOs all the time is the sort of four core challenges. There's there's a massive escalation in threats, which Madeline's talked about, um, and the Center for Threat Informed Defense has the word threat in the title. So we're talking about adopting a threat informed defense strategy. There's a people problem of attrition or not enough skilled folks. Um, there's a tool sprawl, which you've got tons of capabilities in your environment, and there's a mismatch between the business and the board for communicating about security challenges. So that tends to be what, when we speak to customers, that tends to be where they're starting from. But the proposition that we have is it's actually that um, the biggest problem is not budget or tooling or what the attackers do to get in. The biggest problem is you're not testing enough. People need to think like the attacker and test continuously and programmatically. And that gets to the World Cup point that I was making about Macy. Um, so as I mentioned, I just added this while uh, while we were talking. This is the Solar Winds Alert. The beautiful thing about it, so this is what came out in December of 2021. You can't read any of this, but this is a MITRE attack technique here on the right, initial infection vector, TA0001, right? And then it goes through all the different numbers, the supply chain compromise obviously being the most notable part. And you could fetishize the fact that they did this intrusion through a supply chain compromise, leaving aside the fact that once the intruder broke in, they repeated tactics that we've seen over and over and over and over and over again, right? Like lateral movement. Lateral movement is the Helm's Deep analogy. Like you may break past the perimeter of uh, whatever of the Rohan castle, but once you get in further, you get into Helm's Deep, they're moving laterally or deeper into the environment. So what we do and what we're arguing for defenders to do is security teams have this tendency to think in terms of lists, like compliance. And even with MITRE ATT&CK, you think in terms of like singular tests, like I want to do this atomic test, we're going to do that atomic test. The argument that, that, that I think the industry is now making to itself is you want to pivot to real security outcomes as opposed to compliance lists or as opposed to like singular anatomic tests. You want actual data. So what we've built are these things called attack graphs. And what this does is it strings all the tactics and techniques together into a chain. And this is a, I, I, I can't remember which group this came from. I believe it's a ransomware group. Um, and then you can automate how the adversary is going to behave against all your controls. They'll try the front door. They can't get in the front door. They'll try the side door. They'll do this sort of privilege escalation. And then what you end up generating is data about your security control performance so that you can actually get control of your environment. And how you're doing it is through the practice of threat informed defense. Like that's, that's the argument for implementation, taking the, th the information that we have about the threat, looking at repeatable behaviors over time and running emulations against your program so that you can move from what we have now, like in some cases, 35% effectiveness for some of, the most, some of the most advanced cybersecurity teams in the world using the best software in the world. When they run significant tests, they're like, wow, I'm really not operating that well. So I want to get up to 45%. I want to get up to 75%. The good news is that they are blocking tactics and techniques at all, right? That's good. You're blocking 45, 30%. But 
if you're Congress and you're going to call the, the federal government to the task and say, okay, it's been a year and a half since solar winds, you've got a zero trust strategy, tell me how effective you are. You want them for sure to be like, we're 90% effective at lateral movement. Um, so that's that's how we think about when it comes to defending the cloud is generating that kind of data. Uh, and I'm curious, curious how this resonates with all of you. I love it. I love it. I love it for many reasons because like you're highlighting exactly what I, I'm, I'm trying to get the industry to focus on, which is like I have four things I say: efficiency, efficacy, cost, and a workforce transformation. Like these are four things that if a CISO can solve, it's very powerful for their board if they can describe their value with these four uh, metrics. Now, without having the actual exercise of testing and validating that your controls are actually working it's like you know you built a wall in the battle of helms deep but the wall was made out of paper and not secure enough to handle the type of adversarial behavior that you'd be seeing in the field right or it's like when you know a good example of this is like you know the, the cyber truck uh event when elon threw the uh the the thing at the the ball at the the car window and just shattered it live on TV. <laughs> it was like, at least he said we went through a lot of rigorous testing to make sure this works. But it it there was a vulnerability, which was after repeated use, it it'll break, right? Uh, and we have to think about there's no way to actually prove our security controls are working uh, if we're not testing them. And there's a lot of like cyber hygiene from like content creation to analytics to the validation of these things and also not just for a singular uh, technique but also like chaining techniques together because your goal like and all instant responders know this like instant responders happen to be the people that are most in charge of building the story stitching together the story of like when an attacker had got in and what all the things that happened in between like these attack chains are super critical and being able to validate that you can protect against these sort of attack chains. I mean, that's, that is literally how you're going to get to a place where you can confidently say that we can defend ourselves against X or Y adversarial behavior instead of like, uh, just, just lateral movement, you know? Yeah. Just piling on, um, you know, obviously Jonathan, you, you know, that, that sort of shift in thinking towards, um, like, kind of the, the graph or the sequence of steps the adversaries take I, is something that I, I believe is critical. Um, for yeah, back to the rest of folks here, yeah. we're, we're actually running a project right now in the center's research program that's aspiring to do just that. It's to develop a, a an open data model for describing the sequence of steps that adversaries take. Um, so it would allow you to kind of model in, a, in an open fashion that uh, that graph of an attack tech. The, of, a, of a attack um, you know fundamentally it's critical to think about you know how do I defend against this specific um, attack technique this specific behavior but it's important to think about that behavior in the context of a full attack and um, you know you won't not necessarily have to focus on every single step in that um, sequence of, tech, of uh, techniques in a, an overall attack you might be able to, to focus on you know a, a particular step like preventing lateral movement um, yeah. that would then kind of mitigate the entire rest of the attack right if you've managed to do a really good job of defending against lateral movement right um, so yeah, there's definitely this overall need to kind of shift towards thinking about the full life cycle of an attack in addition to thinking about how do I defend against specific behaviors yeah, and I'll say like one of the reasons we developed the attack graph, um, in particular CrowdStrike, who's like a close partner of ours, right? They've got a heuristic analytic within their platform that because they were getting a lot of false positives initially, like in, in, in terms of detections that were going off, that they had to say this is a, this is normal behavior. And in some cases, organizations will will use actually what is more commonly ascribed to an adversary as a part of their normal behavior because they need to facilitate some kind of transaction. So the reason why we developed the attack graph is we want to have it be comprehensive enough that the that the machine or the humans at, at, at CrowdStrike's Overwatch Center will, will be like, okay, this actually looks like a real adversary. This isn't just a single test or something like that. Um, and that's actually, there's, there's, there's the partnerships that we have within industry are incredibly important for um, 
we need to be able to test the controls that matter. So Google GCP or Azure or AWS, like the cl the native cloud controls that are in in the, the platforms that y'all have built, that's supremely important for us, right? There's a ton of those controls and folks, a lot of folks just don't even know that they're there to begin with because like they're too busy using it for, for storage and they've tacked on the vendor separately. So it's important to, to point that point out as well. Yeah, looking at the attack graph work here, like it is kind of the next step in in detecting malicious behavior because we we all kind of started as an industry with indicators and massive feeds of static indicators that would quickly expire, and we've kind of shifted into behavioral heuristic analytics and detections like that, and then chaining those behavioral detections together is just the natural progression of being a bit more mature as an industry. Yeah, I'm trying to. I was trying to open up another one of our attack graphs, but um, Madison or Jordan, maybe you could put the the blog in the chat so that folks could, we, one of the things that we do now is whenever US CERT launches an alert about an emergent behavior, we produce an initial assessment within the first 24 hours to say, these are the key capabilities that the adversary is displaying and you should test yourself against this part of it. But then we have an attack graph within 72 hours that we produce. So it's to say this thing has come out, U.S. CERT is doing it. Obviously, there's there's problems that you're still dependent on um, Cyber Command or FBI or CISA to do the alerts. And I think actually there will come a time when Microsoft or Google's threat intel is, is as important. Um, and I'm curious, like I'm actually curious how much y'all funnel your early intelligence into CISA for those kinds of alerts. I've, I haven't thought about this in quite some time. Maybe you have an answer, Madeline. Oh, I don't know that I'm the right person to ask that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's obviously an important part of the conversation because the platforms, the global platforms, see adversary activity in a way that the federal government, you know, federal government only has NSA and CIA and FBI, right? That's a lot. To, that's not oh. downplaying. <laughs> uh, and then the Five Eyes, obviously, the Canada and the United Kingdom um, and other members of the Five Eyes whose names are escaping me, they're like sharing, sure. yes, yeah, th sharing threat intelligence all the time, but. The, the, the building that public-private partnership for threat intelligence sharing and then funneling the information into MITRE ATT&CK is like such a powerful and transformative idea. But we're coming up, we're coming up on the end. Um, and so I want to see if, uh, I want to give each of you like any final thoughts you'd like to, you'd like to say to the group. Let's start with John. Yeah. Sure. Mr. Baker. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, uh, you guys kind of heard it from Madeline and Amon and Jonathan, you know, my role in running the Center for Threat and Foreign Defense is, I, I really think of us as a convener, trying to bring together um, organizations to solve problems and, and really uh, make threat and foreign defense scale to the global community. Um, this particular project is a step in that direction. We've got a bunch more work to do and, and in my mind, it's incredibly important that as we progress down our research agenda, we're working to make things accessible to the whole community. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll go next. Um, I mean, I've said it multiple times. It's almost like webinar bingo, how many times you can hear common vocabulary. But uh, I do think it's just kind of solidified as the de facto um, sort of mm -hmm. common language across the industry. That's great. And like, as John said, it's um, helping create a community and a, a, a place for resources that are um, usable by many, many different types of people across the industry. Um, and from whether you're just starting out or you have a limited budget or you're on the other end entirely, um, I think it's a testament to the work that MITRE does and the center does that it's really fostered this community of engagement. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the the most important part of this is that we have, you know, such a limited amount of experience in the world, you know, as a society with this, um, with our digital lives, like our, you know, we've had millions of years of, you know, non-digital lives. And this is the first time we now have transition where kids today are born on TikTok and like this is how people live now right and this is how people operate so the only way that we can basically accelerate the development of uh, what it means to be secure in our digital lives because we've we've done that in our physical lives you threat model all the time right we, i've talked about this right you, you lock your doors you put your seat belts on like everyone naturally has 
instincts to threat model. But in our digital lives, we don't. And the only way it's going to improve is because if we if we actively foster um, people to get involved in the community-based work, to research, and we're going to have some failed initiatives, sure, but this is the purpose. You get in what you put in, or sorry, you get out what you put in, and the more people that are involved in these types of community-based initiatives, the better the outcomes can be, and also the better we can drive towards this place where we can actually make more and more sense of this easier, make it more usable uh, for building threat informed defenses for organizations worldwide. So I definitely appreciate being a part of, of this group here. And, and I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff to come. Thank you. Thank you all of you. It is like, it is so cool to, to be able to join each of you in this conversation. Um, and thank you also for contributing to the book. So if you if you liked what you heard, uh, you can read Madeline and Iman's thoughts, and then this other guy, uh, John. Well, the two Jonathans both contributed uh, directly and indirectly to the book. Um, so check it out if you're interested. But um, I would say, you know, we need to keep doing more and more of this together, like as the research gets further on, um, and and helping folks to adopt the best practices that uh, that we're hearing from from the field, from customers in particular, who are who are really the reasons why we're here, right? Like. Those kinds of relationships are so vital to make these platforms work in the way that we that we need to to solve the the transformative challenges that the internet has wrought. So thank you very much. Um, uh, and for those of you that tuned in, if you have any questions, um, you can find each of us on LinkedIn. And I can te can testify that uh, each of them does answer their LinkedIn messages. So check them out. Um, and uh, um, uh, and otherwise, uh, find us on the internet in other ways. So thank you so very much. Really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining, everyone. Take care.